Part three of Chapter two of Stories of Animal Sagacity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Stories of Animal Sagacity by W. H. G. Kingston. Part three. Chapter two. Dogs. The Affectionate Poodle A gentleman residing at Dresden possessed a poodle, which he had always treated kindly, and which was especially fond of him. He at length, however, made a present of her to a friend living about nine miles off. It being supposed that she would probably try to return to her former master, she was tied up till she became the mother of three young puppies and so devoted to them did she appear that her new owner no longer feared she would quit him. He, therefore, gave her liberty. Shortly afterwards, however, she and the three puppies were missing. Search was made for them in vain. At length, her master's Dresden friend paid him a visit and told him that on the preceding evening the poodle had arrived at his house with one of her puppies in her mouth and that another had been found dead on the road. It appeared she had started at night, carrying the pups, which were still too young to walk, one at a time, a certain distance, intending to go back for the others. She had hoped, thus, to transfer them all to her former much-loved home. The third puppy was never found. The one that died had perished by cold, it being winter season. End of the Affectionate Poodle the Newfoundland Dog and the Hats. In sagacity, the Newfoundland surpasses dogs of all other breeds. Two gentlemen, brothers, were out shooting wild fowl, attended by one of these noble animals. Having thrown down their hats on the grass, they, together, crept through some reeds to the river bank, along which they proceeded some way, after firing at the birds. Wishing at length for their hats, one of which was smaller than the other, they sent the dog back for them. The animal, believing it was his duty to bring both together, made several attempts to carry them in his mouth. Finding some difficulty in doing this, he placed the smaller hat within the larger one and pressed it down with his foot. He was thus, with ease, enabled to carry them both at the same time. Perhaps he had seen old clothesmen thus carrying hats, but I am inclined to think he was guided by seeing that this was the best way to effect his object. There are two ways of doing everything, a wrong one and a right one. Like the Newfoundland dog, try to find out the right way and do what you have to do in that way. End of The Newfoundland Dog and the Hats the Newfoundland Dog and the Wreck. How often has the noble Newfoundland Dog been the means of saving the lives of those perishing in the water? A heavy gale was blowing when a vessel was seen driving toward the coast of Kent. She struck, and the surf rolled furiously round her. Eight human beings were observed, clinging to the wreck, but no ordinary boat could be launched to their aid. And in those days, I believe, no lifeboats existed. At all events, not as they do now, on all parts of the coast. It was a feared every moment that the unfortunate seamen would perish when a gentleman came down to the beach, accompanied by a Newfoundland dog. He saw that, if a line could be stretched between the wreck and the shore, the people might be saved, but it could only be carried from the vessel to the shore. He knew how it must be done. Putting a short stick in the mouth of the animal, he pointed to the vessel. The courageous dog understood his meaning, and springing into the sea, fought his way through the waves. In vain, however, he strove to get up the vessel's side, but he was seen by the crew, who, making fast a rope to another piece of wood, hove it toward him. The sagacious animal understood the object, and seizing the piece of wood, dragged it through the surf, and delivered it to his master. 
a line of communication was thus formed between the vessel and the shore and every man on board was rescued from a watery grave end of the newfoundland dog and the wreck dandy the miser dandy a newfoundland dog belonging to mr mcintyre of edinburgh stands unrivalled for his cleverness and the peculiarity of his habits dandy would bring any article he was sent for by his master selecting it from a heap of others in the same description one evening when a party was assembled one of them dropped a shilling after a diligent search it could nowhere be found mr mcintyre then called to dandy who had been crouching in a corner of the room and said to him find the shilling dandy and you shall have a biscuit on this dandy rose and placed the coin which he had picked up unperceived by those present upon the table dandy who had many friends was accustomed to receive a penny from them every day which he took to a baker's and exchanged for a loaf of bread for himself it happened that one of them was accosted by dandy for his usual present when he had no money in his pocket i have not a penny with me to-day but i have one at home said the gentleman scarcely believing that dandy understood him on returning to his house however he met dandy at the door demanding admittance evidently come for his penny the gentleman happening to have a bad penny gave it to him but the baker refused to give him a loaf for it dandy receiving it back returned to the door of the donor and when a servant had opened it laid the false coin at her feet and walked away with an indignant air dandy however frequently received more money than he required for his necessities and took to hoarding it up this was discovered by his master in consequence of his appearing one sunday morning with a loaf in his mouth when it was not likely he would have received a present suspecting this mr mcintyre told a servant to search his room in which dandy slept for money the dog watched her apparently unconcerned till she approached his bed when seizing her gown he drew her from it on her persisting he growled and struggled so violently that his master was obliged to hold him when the woman discovered seven pence half penny from that time forward he exhibited a strong dislike to the woman and used to hide his money under a heap of dust at the back of the premises people thought dandy was a very clever dog as he was but there are many things far better than cleverness it strikes me that he was a very selfish fellow and therefore like selfish boys and girls unamiable he was an errant beggar too i'll say no more about him pray do not imitate dandy end of dandy the miser the dog and the burglar some years ago a stranger arrived at the house of a shopkeeper in deptford who let lodgings stating that he had just arrived from the west indies and would take possession of rooms the next day but would send his trunk that night the trunk was brought late in the evening by two porters who were desired as it was heavy to carry it to the bedroom as soon as the family had retired to rest a little spaniel which usually slept in the shop made his way to the door of the chamber where the chest was deposited and putting his nose to it began to bark furiously the people thus aroused opened the door when the dog flew towards the trunk and barked and scratched against it with the greatest vehemence in vain they attempted to draw him away a neighbor was called in when on moving the trunk it was suspected that it must contain something alive they accordingly forced it open when out came the new lodger who had caused himself to be thus brought into the house for the purpose of robbing it if you let lodgings in your heart to strangers take care that your little spaniel conscience keeps wide awake lest some evening a chest may be brought in containing a thief who may rob you before you find out his character the thief may be an evil thought a bad feeling shut up in a chest formed of self-indulgence sloth 
vanity and pride at the first alarm wake up break open the chest call in your faithful neighbor and hand over the new lodger to justice end of the dog and the burglar the poodle and the strange robber an english gentleman traveling abroad was accompanied by a favorite poodle on one occasion he met an agreeable stranger at a hotel to whom as they were both going the same way he offered a seat in his carriage no sooner however had the stranger entered the vehicle than the poodle which had from the first shown a dislike to the man manifested even a greater aversion to him than before they put up for the night at a small inn in a wild and little frequented country and on separating to go to their respective rooms the poodle again snarled at the stranger and was with difficulty restrained from biting him the englishman was awakened in the middle of the night by a noise in his room into which the moonbeam streamed and there he saw the dog struggling with his traveling companion on being overpowered the stranger confessed that he had come for the purpose of stealing the traveller's money being aware that he had a considerable sum with him you have not the instinct which has been given to some dogs and which enables them for their master's protection to detect persons harboring evil intentions towards them but when you meet with a boy or man careless in his conversation a swearer or expressing irreligious or immoral opinions however courteous and agreeable he may otherwise be do not associate with him a moment longer than you can help or he will rob you of what is far more value than a purse of gold end of the poodle and the strange robber the dog holding the thief a dog of the highland breed belonging to lord arbuthnot treated a thief in much the same way as my friend's dog did the robber of his apple orchard the servants going out one morning found a man lying on the ground a short way from the stable with a number of bridles and other horse trappings near him and the dog holding him by the trousers directly the servants appeared the dog let go his hold when the man confessed that the dog had thus held him for five hours when a bad thought or desire steals into your heart or properly speaking rises in it hold it down as the dog did the thief till you are able to rid yourself of it end of dog holding the thief the faithless watch dog faithful as dogs are in general i am sorry to have to record an instance to the contrary a watch dog whose special duty was to remain at his post during the night found that his collar was sufficiently loose to allow him to withdraw his head from it whenever he pleased he acted as some human beings do whose right principles do not fit tightly to their necks slipping out of them at the very time they ought to keep them on the dog was however sagacious enough to know that if he did so during the day he would be seen by his master when to a certainty the collar would be tightened but no sooner did night arrive and the lights began to disappear from the windows than he used to slip his head out of his collar and roam about the neighboring fields sometimes picking up a hare or rabbit for his supper knowing also that the blood on his mouth would betray him he would after his banquet go to a stream and wash it off this done he would return before daybreak to his kennel and slipping his head into his collar lie down in his bed as though he had remained there on the watch all night now i must beg my young readers to remember should they be tempted to do what is wrong that however well behaved they may contrive to appear before their friends and acquaintances in their own mind there will always be the unpleasant feeling arising from the consciousness of doing a guilty action end of the faithless watch dog the shoe blacks dog dogs have been frequently trained to act roguish parts an english officer visiting paris 
was annoyed one day by having a little poodle run up to him and rub his muddy paws over his boots. Near at hand was a seated shoe black to whom he went to have his boots repolished. Having been annoyed in a similar manner by the same dog several times in succession, he watched the animal when he observed him dip his paws in the mud on the banks of the Seine, and then go to rub them on the boots of the well-dressed people passing at the time. Discovering at length that the dog belonged to the shoe black, the gentleman questioned the man, who confessed that he had taught the dog the trick in order to bring business to himself. "'And will you part with your clever dog?' asked the gentleman. The shoe black consented, and a price was fixed upon and paid. The dog accompanied his new master to London, and was shut up for some time, till it was believed that he would remain contentedly in the house. No sooner, however, did he obtain his liberty than he decamped, and a fortnight afterwards he was found with his former master pursuing his old occupation. This story shows the difficulty of getting rid of bad habits and proves that as dogs have been trained, so will they, as well as children, continue to act. The poor poodle, however, knew no better. He was faithful to his former master, and thought he was doing his duty. But boys and girls do know perfectly well when they are acting rightly or wrongly, and should strive unceasingly to overcome their bad habits. End of The Shoe Black's Dog the terrier and the pen a terrier deservedly a pet in the family for his gentleness and amiability was playing with one of the children when suddenly he was heard to utter a snarl followed by a bark the mother rushed to her child and believing it to have been bitten drove off the dog no injury however was apparent the dog retired to a corner where he remained, in an attitude of regret, till the inspection had been finished. He then approached the lady, and with a touch of his paw, claimed attention. It was given, and forthwith he deposited at her feet a pen. The story was thus made plain. The child, finding the pen, had turned the dog's nose into a pincushion. The snarl rebuked the offense and the pen had been taken by the dog, with his mouth, out of the child's hand. No sooner did the dog see that this was understood than he began to lick the little fellow's hand, as if to assure him of his forgiveness, and to beg him to make friends again, which they were ever afterwards. I hope that the little boy, through his whole life, was always ready to profit by the lesson of his dumb companion, and to forgive injuries. End of The Terrier and the Pen The Dog and His Injured Friend Dogs frequently form warm friendships and help each other in times of trouble. Two dogs, belonging to the same owner, had become great friends. Ponto and Dick, we will call them, though I am not quite certain as to their names. Ponto's leg being broken, he was kept a close prisoner. His friend Dick, instead of whining out a few commonplace expressions of sympathy, "'Dear me, I'm so sorry. Well, I hope you will soon get better,' and then scampering off to amuse himself with other dogs in the village, or to run after the cows, or to go out hunting, came and sat down by his side, showing him every mark of attention. Then, after a time, Dick started up, exclaiming, Ponto, I'm sure you must be hungry. It is dull work for you lying there with nothing to do. Without waiting for Ponto to beg that he would not trouble himself, off he set, and soon brought back a nice bone with plenty of gristle on it. There, old fella, munch away. It will amuse you, he remarked, putting his prize down under his friend's nose. After watching complacently as poor Ponto gnawed away with somewhat languid jaws till the bone was scraped almost clean, he again set out in search of another. After he had brought in several, he lay down as before by his friend's side, just playing with one of the bones to keep him company. 
Thus, day after day, Dick continued to cheer and comfort his injured friend with unfailing constancy till he completely recovered. When dogs thus exhibit disinterested kindness and self-sacrifice, how ought human beings to behave to those suffering from pain or sorrow? When tempted to run off and amuse yourself, leaving a sick friend at home, remember these two dogs. Think of how much suffering there is in the world, and what room there is for kindness and compassion, and can you then be hard-hearted or indifferent to the sufferings of others? End of the dog and his injured friend. The dog and the surgeon. I must tell you of another dog which showed not only affection for a companion, but a wonderful amount of sense. He once broke his leg, in which state he was found by a kind surgeon who took him home, set his leg, and after he had recovered, allowed him to go away. The dog did not forget the treatment he had received, nor the person from whom he had received it. Some months afterward, he found another dog whom the same accident had happened. By the language which dogs employ, he told his friend all about his own cure, and, assisting him along the road, led him, late at night, to the surgeon's house. He there barked loudly at the door. No one came, so he barked louder and louder. At last a window was opened, and a person looked out, whom he at once recognized, and great was his joy when the kind surgeon, coming downstairs, opened the door. Wagging his tail, he made such signs as he was capable of using to show what he wanted. The surgeon soon saw what had happened to his old patient's friend, whom he took in and treated in the same skillful way. His former patient, satisfied that all was right, then ran off to attend to his proper duties. Let us, from this kind dog's behavior, learn, whenever we receive a benefit, to endeavor, if possible, to impart it to others, and not to remain selfishly satisfied with the advantage we ourselves have gained. The Dog Preventing the Cat Stealing The owner of a spaniel was one day called away from his dinner table, leaving a dog and a favorite cat in the room. On his return, he found the spaniel stretched her whole length along the table by the side of a leg of mutton, while Puss was skulking in a corner. He soon saw that though the mutton was untouched, the cat had been driven from the table by the spaniel in the act of attempting a robbery on the meat, and that the dog had taken up his post to prevent a repetition of the attempt. The little animal was thus in the habit of guarding eatables, which she believed were left in her charge, and while she would not touch them herself, she kept other dogs and cats at a distance. How much evil might be prevented if boys and girls would always act the part of the faithful little spaniel, only as they have got tongues in their head and know how wrong it is to do what is bad, can they remonstrate lovingly with their companions who may be about to do a wrong thing, and then, if this fails, do their utmost to prevent them. End of the dog preventing the cat stealing. One dog getting assistance from another. Two dogs living in the neighborhood of Kupar in Faith used to fight desperately whenever they met, the one belonging to Captain R, the other to a farmer. Captain R's dog was accustomed to go on messages and even to bring meat and other articles from Kupar in a basket. One day, while returning with a supply of mutton, he was attacked by a number of curs in the town, eager to obtain the tempting prize. The messenger fought bravely, but at length, overpowered, was compelled to yield up the basket, though not before he had secured some of the meat. With this, he hastened at full speed to the quarters of his enemy, at whose feet he lay down, stretching himself beside him, till he had eaten it up. A few sniffs, a few whispers in the ear, and other dog-like courtesies were then exchanged, after which they both set out together for Kupar, where they worried almost every dog in the town, and, returning home, were ever afterwards on the most friendly terms. Remember that there are no human beings whose conduct at all times is safe to follow. Revenge is wrong, but let us ever be ready to help and defend those who are ill-treated and oppressed. End of one dog getting assistance from another. 
The Pointer and the Bad Shot Dogs, like human beings, show they can criticize the conduct of those they serve. A gentleman from London, more accustomed to handle an umbrella than a gun, went down to the house of a friend in the country to enjoy a day's shooting. "'You shall have one of my best pointers,' said his friend. "'But recollect, we, he will stand no nonsense. "'If you kill the birds, well and good. "'If not, I cannot answer for the consequences.' The would-be sportsman shouldered his gun and marched off. As he traversed the fields, the pointer, ranging before him, marked bird after bird, which were as often missed. The pointer looked back, evidently annoyed, and after this frequently ran over game. At length, he made a dead stop near a low bush with his nose pointed downwards, his four feet bent, his tail straight and steady. The gentleman approached with both barrels cocked. Again, the dog moved steadily forward a few paces, expressing the anxiety of his mind by moving his tail backwards and forwards. At length, a brace of partridges slowly rose. Who could possibly miss them? Bang, bang, went both barrels. But the birds continued on their flight unharmed. The dog, now fairly lost patience, turned round, placed his tail between his legs, gave one sad howl, long and loud, and set off full speed homeward, leaving the gentleman to holler after him at the top of a gate, and continue the shooting as best he could by himself. If you desire to be properly served by those you employ, you must be up to your business. I have often heard young people complain that they can do nothing properly. The servants are so stupid. When they come down late, that they were not called in time or if they have not learned their lessons that the room was not ready i dare say when the cockney sportsman returned with an empty game bag he abused the stupid dog for running away end of the pointer and the bad shot bass the great saint bernard dog sir thomas dick lauder had a dog named bass brought when a puppy from the great St. Bernard. His bark was tremendous and might be distinguished nearly a mile off. He was once stolen when a letter carrier, well acquainted with him, heard his bark from inside of a yard and insisted on the man who had him in possession delivering him up. Terrific as was his bark, he was so good-natured that he would never fight other dogs and even allowed a little King Charles Spaniel named Wraith to run off with any bone he might have been gnawing, and to tyrannize over him in a variety of ways. If attacked by an inferior enemy, he would throw his immense bulk down upon his antagonist, and nearly smother him without attempting to bite. He took a particular fancy for one of the Edinburgh postmen, whose duty it was, besides delivering letters, to carry a letter bag from one receiving house to another. This bag he used to give Bass to carry. The dog accompanied him on his rounds, but invariably parted with him opposite the gate of the convent of St. Margaret, and returned home. On one occasion, the postman being ill, sent another man in his place. Bass went up to the stranger, who naturally retired before so formidable-looking a dog. Bass followed, showing a determination to have the post bag. The man did all he could to keep possession of it, but at length, Bass, seeing that it was not likely to be given to him, raised himself on his hind legs, and putting a great forepaw on each of the man's shoulders, laid him flat on his back in the road, then quietly picking up the bag, proceeded peaceably on his wonted way. The man followed, ineffectually attempting to coax the dog to give up the bag. At the first house at which he arrived, the people comforted him by telling him that the dog always carried the bag. Bass walked with the man to all of the houses at which he delivered letters, and along the road till he came to the gate of St. Margaret's, where he dropped the bag and returned home. Accounts exist of the services rendered by these noble dogs of St. Bernard in saving life among the snowy regions of the Alps. It is recounted that one of these dogs preserved twenty-two lives. He at length lost his own in an avalanche, when those he was endeavoring to assist also perished. 
End of Bass, the Great St. Bernard Dog The Dog and the Newspaper Several dogs have been taught to go to the post office for their master's newspapers or to receive them from the newsman. A neighbor of mine, who was fond of telling good stories, which he did not always, perhaps, expect his guests to believe, used to give an account of the cleverness of one of his dogs. The dog went regularly every morning into the neighboring town for the times, and brought it back before breakfast. This was a fact. On one occasion, the dog returned without a paper, so my neighbor used to tell the story. His master sent him back again, when he once more appeared with no paper in his mouth. On this, the owner ordered his cob, and rode into the town to inquire of the postmaster why the paper had not come. Sir, answered the postmaster, your times did not arrive this morning, but when I offered the dog the morning post, he refused to receive it. End of The Dog and the Newspaper The Steady Pointer it is wonderful how completely dogs can be trained to the performance of their duties. A well-practiced pointer was about to leap over a rail when she perceived a nest of partridges close to her nose. Had she moved an inch, she would have frightened them away. There she stood for more than two hours with her legs on the upper bar, awaiting the arrival of the sportsman. For some time she was not discovered, and not till he appeared would she quit her post, when, the birds rising, some of them were shot. But the steady pointer was so stiff, when thus relieved, she could scarcely move. Here is an example, which my young readers should endeavor to follow when they have a duty, however irksome, to perform. Remain steadily at your post. Let nothing draw you away. Do not say, I have stopped at work long enough. I am sick of it. When tempted to give up, remember the steady pointer. End of the steady pointer. The young doctor and Pincher. One of the cleverest and most amusing of dogs was Pincher, a rough Scotch terrier belonging to Mrs. Lee's brother. The boy had a great fancy to be a doctor. Having manufactured a variety of surgical instruments out of flint stones, he pretended to perform with them operations on Pincher, who would lie perfectly still while his teeth were drawn, his limbs set, his veins opened, or his wounds bandaged. The pretended doctor, finally copying the process practiced on pigs, used to cut up his favorite entirely. The dog was laid on the table when he stuck out his legs as stiffly as possible. Preparations were first made for cutting off his head, and immediately the flint was passed across the throat, it fell on one side, and remained so completely without motion that it might have been thought the dog fancied it was really off. Each leg in succession was then operated on, and as the instrument passed round them, the dog made them fall, putting them as close as possible to the body. When the operation was concluded, the boy used to exclaim, Jump up, good dog! And Pincher, bounding off the table, would shake himself to life again. End of the Young Doctor and Pincher Sira, the Ettrick Shepherd's Dog Sira, fortunately for his fame, possessed a master in James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, well able to recount his history. Hogg bought Sira of a drover for a guinea, observing, notwithstanding his dejected and forlorn appearance, a sort of sullen intelligence in his countenance. Though he had never turned a sheep in his life, as soon as he discovered it was his duty to do so, he began with eagerness and anxiety to learn his evolutions. He would try every way deliberately till he found out what his master wanted him to do, and when once he understood a direction, he never forgot it again or mistook it. Often, when hard-pressed in accomplishing a task he was put to, he had expedients for the moment that bespoke a great share of the reasoning faculty. On one occasion, about 700 lambs were under Hogg's care at weaning time, broke up at midnight, and scampered off in three divisions across the neighboring hills, in spite of all he and an assistant could do to keep them together. The night was so dark that Sarah could not be seen, 
but the faithful animal had heard his master lament their absence in words which set him at once on the alert and without more ado he had silently gone off in quest of the recreant flock in vain hogg and his assistant spent the whole night in searching for their lost charge and they were on their way home to inform their master of their loss when they discovered a lot of lambs at the bottom of a deep ravine and the indefatigable sira standing in front of them looking round for some relief but still true to his charge believing that it was only one of the divisions what was their astonishment when they discovered the whole flock and not one lamb a-wanting how he had got all the divisions collected in the dark it is impossible to say the charge was left to him from midnight till the rising sun and if all the shepherds in the forest had been there to assist him they could not have effected it with greater propriety hogg relates many other anecdotes of sarah on one occasion he brought back a wild ewe which no one could catch from amid numerous flocks of sheep he showed great indignation when the ewe being brought home was set at liberty among the other sheep of his master he had understood that the animal was to be kept by itself and that he was to be the instrument of keeping it so and he considered himself insulted by the ewe being allowed to go among other sheep after he had been required to make such exertion and had made it so successfully to keep it separate a single shepherd and his dog says hogg will accomplish more in collecting highland sheep from a farm than twenty shepherds could do without dogs without the shepherd's dog the whole mountainous land in scotland would not be worth six pence it would require more hands to gather a flock of sheep from the hills into their folds and to drive them to the market than the profits of the whole flock would be capable of maintaining here we have an example of a dull unattractive looking dog becoming of the very utmost canine usefulness i have known many an apparently dull boy by perseveringly endeavoring to learn what he has to do and then steadily pursuing the course marked out for him rise far above his quick and so-called clever but careless companions i do not say work for the purpose of rising but work because it is right remember sirrah learn your duty and do it however disagreeable it may seem end of sirrah the ettrick shepherd's dog the dog and the fowls a house dog whose kennel was in a farmyard used to have his mess of food brought to him daily in a tin can and placed before his abode no sooner had the cook disappeared than the poultry were in the habit of collecting round and abstracting the contents of the can the dog a good-natured animal bore their pilfering for some time without complaining but at length as they carried off more than he considered fair he warned them away by growling and exhibiting his teeth notwithstanding this they again returned to the can when the dog instead of seizing some of his persecutors lifted the can in his mouth and conveyed it within his kennel where he finished his meal in peace while the cocks and hens stood watching without afraid to enter depend on it you will often find the means of avoiding annoyances much after the method pursued by that sensible house dog without retaliating on those who annoy you if you cannot otherwise pacify them Remove the cause of dispute out of sight. End of the dog and the fowls. Barbacock, the Greenland dog. The dog is the companion of the savage, as well as the civilized man in all parts of the world. He accompanies the wretched Fugen in his hunts, partaking somewhat of the character of his master, and is the friend and assistant of the Eskimo in the Arctic regions. The Eskimo dogs, though hardly treated, show great affection for their masters and frequently exhibit much sagacity. Captain Hall, the Arctic explorer, had a Greenland dog called Barbicark. One day they were out hunting on the frozen snow-covered sea when a herd of deer appeared in sight chase was given 
One was wounded, but not killed, and off went the herd as fleet as the wind, now turning in one direction, now in another, among ice hummocks. The rest of the dogs followed in their tracks. Barbicark, however, was seen to strike away in a direct line over the snow, regardless of the animal's footsteps. On and on went Barbicark, straight for a spot which brought him close upon the deer. The latter immediately changed their course, and so did Barbicark, hot in pursuit of them. At length the hunters, unable longer to endure the cold, were compelled to return to the ship, believing that the deer had escaped. At midday, Barbicark appeared on board with blood round his mouth and over his body. It was supposed that he had fallen in with the deer, but not that he could have possibly killed one. He, however, showed his actions that he wished to draw the attention of the crew to the quarter where he had been chasing. He kept whining, going first to one, then to another, now running towards the gangway steps, then back again. At last, one of the men having to visit the wreck of a vessel which lay near, Barbacark followed. But seeing that the man went no further, off went Barbacark to the northwest by himself. On this, some of the crew, convinced he must have killed a deer, put on their thick coats and followed him. They proceeded nearly three miles when they found Barbacark and the other Greenland dogs seated upon their haunches round a deer lying dead before them. The throat of the poor animal had been cut with Barbacark's teeth as effectually as by the knife of a white man or Eskimo, and a piece of the tongue had been bitten out. As soon as the sailors appeared, Barbacark jumped up from his watchful position and ran to meet them with manifestations of delight, looking up at them as much as to say, I have done the best I could. I have killed the deer and eaten just one luscious mouthful, and now I give up the animal to you and merely ask for myself and companions who have been faithfully guarding the prize, such portion as you yourselves may disdain. Several crows were pecking away at the carcass, but Barbacark and they were always on good terms. Sometimes, indeed, he allowed them to rest upon his back, and consequently he did not drive them away. On another occasion, a party of the explorers were out with a sleigh and dogs, and among them was Barbacark. They were caught in a fearful gale, the snow beating in their faces. Eskimo dogs are often unmanageable when an attempt is made to force them in the teeth of a storm, and so it now proved. The leader lost his way and confused the rest. The men, as well as the dogs, were becoming blinded. The leading dog directed the team toward some islands, but on approaching them, it was seen that Barbacark was struggling to make a different route. Happily, he was allowed to have his own way, and in a short time, he led the party direct to the ship. End of Barbacark, the Greenland Dog The Eskimo Dog Smile Captain Hall had another dog, Smile by name, the noblest looking and best leader and seal and bear dog ever met with. One day he was out with dogs and sleigh where the ice was still firm, when suddenly a seal was noticed ahead. In an instant the dogs were dashing towards the prey, drawing the sledge after them at a marvelous rate, led by Smile. The seal for a moment seemed frightened, and kept on the ice a second or two too long, for just as he plunged, Smile caught him by the tail and nippers. The seal struggled violently and so did Smile, making the sledge caper about merrily. But in a moment more, the other dogs laid hold, and aided in dragging the seal out of his hole onto the ice, when Smile took it in charge. The prize was secured entirely by the dogs, indeed without any aid from the men. End of the Eskimo Dog Smile End of Part 3 of Chapter 2 of Stories of Animal Sagacity Dogs